Second session begins with magnifying the situation, addressing contaminants of emerging concern. Since the Flint, Michigan water crisis broke in 2014, there's been a heightened awareness and legitimate concern about contaminants and water supplies and the governing bodies that are charged with ensuring water is safe. To moderate our second session, we have Kevin Hardy, Executive Director of the National Water Research Institute. And in this role, Kevin works with researchers, executives, appointed and elected officials, and community stakeholders to develop and refine science-based regulations that support safe and effective water reuse. For 28 years, NWRI has been actively engaged in funding research on the fate and transport of pollutants through both natural and engineered environmental systems and in the facilitation of independent advisory panels that provides consensus-based scientific and technical guidance to practitioners around the world. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Hardy. Hey, Kevin. Fritz, thank you. It's a pleasure to, to see you. you. My goodness, I just got introduced by Fritz Coleman. What's going on around here? <laughs> well, thank you. The National Water Research Institute was founded in 1991 by a group of Orange County visionaries. And their vision was to create effectively an institute without walls, uh, made up of the world's leading researchers with a purpose of creating new sources of healthy water. And today, while we uh, do indeed have walls in an office here in Fountain Valley, uh, our impact on both the international and national water communities continues to grow. For example, we recently awarded the 25th annual Athlete Richardson Clark Prize to Dr. Janet Herring. Janet is a UCLA-based water researcher at AVOG, the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology. And she was awarded for her work to dramatically reduce chemical impacts on the water quality of Europe's iconic lakes and rivers. So in collaboration with universities, public bodies, industry and non-governmental organizations, institutes like NWRI and AVOG work to harmonize often conflicting ecological, economic and social interests that arise from our efforts to effectively manage our water resources and thus serve as a bridge between the scientific and the real world. Working with the best and brightest minds in the world, some of whom are in this room today, NWRI is working to solve the complex technical, scientific, and policy issues related to the natural and engineered systems that create the abundant and healthy water supplies, which serve as a foundational building block for thriving communities across the world. And this task has never presented more, a more robust set of challenges and none more complicated than the persistence of chemical contaminants in the environment. The Chemical Abstract Services is a division of the American Chemical Society that's dedicated to improving people's lives through the transforming power of chemistry. Their CAS registry contains more than 151 million unique organic and inorganic chemicals, substances such as alloys, coordination compounds, minerals, mixtures, polymers, salts, and all their related sequences. Of the 84 to, 84, 84 to 85,000 of these that are in the stream of commerce in the United States, uh, we have regulations through the Toxic Substance Control Act uh, to ensure that our exposure to these chemicals is maintained at a safe level. But as a practical matter, there are likely tens of thousands of chemicals in use here today in California. And likely, just as many that are no longer in use, that persist in our environment. While most of these chemicals perform as designed for a specific quality of life improving purpose, others are potentially harmful either on their own or acting in combination with other uh, environmental factors that are present. And we all know that once chemicals get into the environment, they tend to end up in our drinking water supplies. So with this national and international attention on water quality scandals, as was mentioned earlier by Flint, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on state and federal regulators to fast track regulations for a slew of new contaminants of emerging concern. Also, you'll hear them referred to as CECs, including nanomaterials, synthetic materials, microplastics, and PFOA, PFOS, and other 
per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. I just wanted to say that. <coughs> So as the state uh, regulatory process on such CECs moves forward, water agencies are faced with having to address costly and contradictory notification response requirements before proper testing methods have been solidified or before thorough toxicology and health impact studies are conducted to confirm safe levels of exposure. So we need to ask ourselves, are we approaching the regulation of CECs in the right way? Are we confusing the public or losing their trust? that critical trust that underlies the appropriate investment in our water quality. So in this session, we will learn more about these PER and polyfluorinated compounds, hear about the state of California's process for setting regulatory advisory limits uh, for these contaminants, and specifically the current posture of their efforts to regulate PFOA and PFOS. We'll also hear about what's happening at the federal level and in other states, about testing taking place here in Orange County today, and how a local retail agency is meeting state requirements and dealing with some of the challenges of advisory guidelines versus mandates. Our speakers today include Darren Polimus, the Deputy Director of the Division of Drinking Water from the State Water Resources Control Board, Jason Datticus, the Executive Director of the Water Quality and Technology at the Orange County Water District, and Dr. Wayne Miller, a board member for the Yorba Linda Water District. Each of these speakers will make a presentation and, and complete their remarks, and then we'll have an opportunity to ask them questions. If you want to learn more about their bios, as we mentioned earlier, they're available in the program. Please join me in welcoming Darren Polimus, Jason Datticus, and Dr. Wayne Miller to the stage. Darren, we'll start with you. Great. Well, I feel a little bit like we're going from the history lesson to modern science, so I guess in a galaxy far, far away. Um, Perfect. Get, the, get my slides to show up here. All right, first slide. You've heard this name a couple times, per and uh, polyfluoro alkyl substances. I'm only going to say it once. I'm going to go to PFAS and PFOA, PFOS. So, sorry, but I think most people actually know it more as that than the, the real name, so I'm going to use the the abbreviations. These are, has been mentioned several times now, used in many consumer products, um, all kinds of modern technology. In fact, I lament that some of my favorite coats have Gore-Tex and other things in it. And we're not even, I'm not even sure what all contains these materials. We do know though that two of the most ones we're going to talk about here, PFO and PFOS, were largely used in uh, aqueous firefighting foam and some other things. They're no longer used uh, as we go through it. But one of the key things of why these materials are a little different than any we've seen before is the molecular bond between the carbon molecule and the fluorine molecule. It's stronger than uh, bonds that can be broken naturally by biodegradation. So these materials will stay around for an awful long time in the environment. And that's kind of one of the most scary parts about them being a regulator, knowing that it's just not going to degrade over time. It's going to be there. It may attenuate out and, and uh, go forward like that, but it's it's a, a bit different than some of the ones that we can count on natural degradation to help us with. Here's a list of what they've been used in. You've seen this many times. Like I said, the PFOA and PFOS were largely part of the firefighting foams, and they're just two of these thousands of PFASs that we know are manufactured and used. So um, I'm really just starting with a small component of what may be a bigger picture as we learn more and uh, get into it. But, the, the one, we're basically working from a, a health standard uh, or a health, health understanding of where we are uh, with the health aspects of it and these two are known to be um, toxic uh, for, the, for the components and we're learning more about them and I'll get into that in a second. All right, so um, let's do a little bit of what's kind of happened. Uh, basically the way we discovered how the extent of these through the U.S. is through what's called uh, UCMR3, or the Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule, USCPA does this on a cycle and we're uh, actually beginning UCMR, we're in UCMR4 now and they're planning UCMR5, so it's a regularly scheduled component of testing. Uh, in that testing there was six PFAS compounds, you can see them listed there, it gets a little bit alphabet soup. Uh, and uh, one thing to kind of note is that this early testing, the detection limits were much higher, even though if you notice the PPT means parts per trillion. So we're talking really minuscule amounts of it. Uh, and I'll show you later, we go even lower now than the 40 and the 20 there. But 
From that testing, there was 133 uh, detections in California. These were, again, the larger water systems that test, and then a subsample of the small systems. So we don't really know its full extent. We know uh, from the larger systems that are impacted at these higher levels uh, and where we're at with that. So beyond that, we've other water systems in California have diligently continued testing and we now have a total of 297 detections uh, beyond what the UCMR3 originally found. US EPA is a health advisory. This is their preliminary non-regulatory advisory, uh, but they issued it with some level of concern. So they said that if you find PFO and PFOS and you add those together, you should not exceed 70 parts per trillion in your water system. So uh, we took that serious. We contacted the water systems. Luckily, there was only a few in California that were above that level, and they took those sources offline or showed that they had blending or treatment that were addressing it. Uh, following the detections above that, uh, here's the nine systems that did have it and uh, were taken offline. So that was... Uh, a good step kind of in the initial phase of where we were headed. Now to 2018, uh, so more information had come out. I work with at, the, at Cal EPA with the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. Uh, they provide tech toxicology information for us and based on their recommendations, the Division of Drinking Water issued two notification levels. Again, an advisory level, non-regulatory, but our initial level of concern to try to put people this on people's radar and have them start to contemplate about future addressing it. We set those at 13 parts per trillion for PFOA, or excuse me, for PFOS, and 14 parts per trillion for PFOA. Uh, the response level from that we set, so when we set a notification level, basically uh, that's the first level of uh, kind of concern a response level, some multiplier above that where we try to indicate uh, that you should take action even more serious and we matched the US EPA 70 part per trillion there. And uh, for the water sources that were at the notification level, we had 18 for PFOA and 25 for PFOS in the state. So let me explain a little bit. This is really kind of the confusing part. Um, notification levels, again, are non-regulatory and I don't require systems to test. They're really an advisory out to the water systems that we have a concern, they should possibly be concerned, and they need to factor that into how their operations go. Uh, what a notification level does require, though, is that if they do do a test, they have to give me the information, so I collect that at the state level, and if, they're if they test at a level above their notification level, then they're required to inform their uh, board of directors or whatever their governing body is, be it a city council or whatever their water system operating is. We do also recommend that they notify consumers, and most water systems do that, maybe through the consumer confidence report that comes out annually um, as part of an adjunct to that communication, but we do recommend that they uh, talk to that. The response level is where we make it a little more serious. Uh, Generally, it's 10 to 100 times above the notification level when we're talking about that. And in those instances, it's high enough now that we have more concerns. You have to realize that at these levels, the health impacts are fuzzy. There's some information that's being gleaned from studies that have been done, but it's not real certain yet as to what the total health impacts might or might be as we go on. And of course, we'll learn more as we keep going along. So we do recommend that a water system, if they can, take their, their uh, source water out of service at a response level. Now to the regulatory levels. So we're not in this stage yet. We're, the notification levels and response levels are kind of the first component of moving in this direction. Uh, then you get to maximum contaminant level. This would be a true regulatory level that we've now established through a lengthy process. Um, we basically first asked the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment to establish a public health goal. That public health goal is like our target of what would be the most healthy for drinkers of water in California. That target is often hard to meet because it's often a really small number. Um, so from that, we have to go through a process to establish the MCL. Considerations go into, you know, can you even detect the material at that lower level? Second would be, can you treat it to that level? And then third is an economic feasibility associated with establishing that. But our statutes in California do say 
and command us that we should be as close to the public health goal as we can, considering those three factors that I just mentioned. So, uh, notification levels for other PFAS compounds. There's thousands of them, uh, and there's a question about where we should go there. I have two, and it's a little scary to talk about two when you know there's a bunch more. So we're still trying to gather information on that and move ahead uh, with that. There is another kind of interesting component, um, understanding that there are so many variations of these uh, PFAS materials. Uh, OEHA is looking at what they call read across, where they can take the toxicology uh, study from one material and transfer it to what they believe will be the actions of others. So that's being investigated uh, at the moment as well. So let's talk a little bit about what we're doing in California uh, from this information. We're uh, implementing a phased investigation. Uh, first off, this is a, a slide that shows uh, the first parts, of the, several parts of the phase in a graphic format. Uh, we know that we're concerned about landfill components, uh, wastewater treatment plants, airports where the aqueous firefighting foam was used, and uh, eventually other places that had aqueous firefighting foam like uh, field terminals and other components like that. So remember, the notification level doesn't require anybody to test, but if they do test, they have to tell me. Based on this approach, uh, what we've done is we've uh, proceeded to issue investigative orders, which is another authority we have, where we have a specific concern uh, around a material that may be at a location, and we want to know more investigative about that. So those orders have gone out uh, both to uh, commercial airports where they were having aqueous firefighting foam, um, as well as adjacent uh, public water supply wells uh, that are in a radius around those. So we're basically attacking this from two parts of the State Water Board's authority. One is a potential discharger that may have discharged it and asking them to find out whether they had the material, where they used it at, is it in the soil, and did it make its way to the water? And then from my standpoint, from the Division of Drinking Water, basically asking, is it in the water supply nearby these possible sites of contamination? Uh, the landfills is very similar. Uh, we've issued order to those. Those are a regulated entity by the, re the regional water boards in California. Uh, so we've already started there as well. They have monitoring uh, systems set up so that they're following through with that and uh, going quickly to do that. We're also looking at the well radiuses of the water systems around that. Um, as kind of an aside, a lot of people don't realize how close they are to some landfills because these are often closed and no longer in use. So I get calls from water systems all the time saying, why am I getting an order? I'm like, you're near a landfill. And they're like, no, I'm not. And I'm like, you're right between three of them. You didn't know that. Let me show you on the map. So um, there are quite a few places in California. Uh, public water system sampling. So uh, for the water systems that are under our authority, 612 of them uh, have water supply wells that are going to be targeted for sampling. And those results will come in. They're going to do four. They're going to do sampling each quarter for four quarters and report that information to us. And um, 192 public water systems receive that of those 612 wells. So uh, we're using uh, new methods now that go much lower in detection than was done with the UCMR3. So we expect to find it in places that we may not have known or at levels that were below the detection limits in the first round of testing that first discovered this in California. Uh, so there's going to be other phases coming along. I'm going to quickly go through these. but. We're going to look other places where PFO and PFOS were used. Chrome, chrome platers is one of those. Uh, they're obviously scattered throughout our industrial areas. And um, they used uh, PFO and PFOS as a fume suppressant to try to prevent chrome 6 from uh, coming up. Uh, we've got other things that will be on the, the future as we look for how to further branch out and make sure that this isn't affecting water supplies. These are some other sources as well that will come up in next phased approaching. So kind of the next three months, um, this is the schedule that we're going to go through. We should have some of our first good results from the drinking water systems about the end of July, beginning of August from their first quarter. And, um, and that's exactly right. Because when that data comes in, that's probably what I'm going to say. And I'm going to stop there and uh, turn it over. Congratulations. Well done, Jared. Thank you. Again, we'll save our questions for uh, after all the presentations. Next up is Jason Dadakis with the Orange County Water District. Great. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Um, 
So with that nice uh, overview from, from Darren at the state level about what they're doing, some background on, the, uh, on PFAS, um, really lets me kind of hone into on what we're doing um, with these compounds here in, here in Orange County. Um, so I get my slide to, yes, so, so PFAS in Orange County. Um, one thing before I get to that I did want to mention and just to reinforce uh, a point that um, Darren made is that when we talk about PFAS, we are eventually going to be talking probably about more than just PFOA and PFOS. Uh, EPA has this nice diagram they come out just kind of about the range of perfluorinated compounds that have been used in industry over time uh, and, and currently. Um, and you can see up to the right there, PFOA and PFOS fall into that upper right-hand category there. Um, but it is a much broader family uh, of compounds that we may need to be concerned with here. Um, so just real quick, this map of Orange County Water District Service Area here in the black outline. Um, when I talk about any results or investigations that are going on, um, it's really talking about what's happening in, in our service area, uh, OCW service area pictured here. Um, so the initial testing we did here, kind of piggybacking off what, what Darren presented, was during that UCMR3 program. Uh, our laboratory developed the capabilities to do testing on behalf of the large um, groundwater producers of public water systems in Orange County. Um, the six targets were there, um, including PFOA and PFOS. And to kind of summarize those results, um, we tested 135 drinking water sources uh, in our service area, primarily wells, but also reservoirs and blending points. Um, five of our retail agencies had detections uh, of these compounds, and three of them um, had detections above that health advisory uh, that Darren mentioned. And interestingly, if you look at the time of this, this testing was done before that health advisory came out. Um, so we folks had to deal with that uh, that health advisory kind of, kind of after the fact, um, after they'd reported their data at EPA. Uh, and generally, when we looked at where these were occurring in our service air, they were happening down gradient of many of our recharge areas uh, in, the, in sort of the interior portion of the basin. And so we kind of wanted to track that down and figure out what was happening. So since then, since 2016, these are the responses that we've been doing with our retail agency stakeholders. Uh, first, we've improved our laboratory method. Uh, we've improved the sensitivity and lowered the detection limit. Uh, we can now see these compounds down to four parts per trillion or four nanograms per liter, so about an order of mag magnitude more sensitive than during the UCMR testing. And we've expanded our target list. We now regularly test for 14 of these compounds. Um, we're looking to expand that list soon to 18 uh, under the improved EPA method. And so we've used this testing to really um, try to figure out why are we getting these detections in, in groundwater in Orange County. Um, so we have a vast marine wall network here that the district runs as a, as a part of its basin management activities. So we've been testing there and also testing our recharge supplies. So many of you know of our groundwater replenishment system project. We've been testing that extensively. Uh, we purchased raw imported water from Metropolitan Water District for recharge. We've been testing that. And then as we heard earlier today, the Santa Ana River is a key component of our replenishment of the basin. We've been testing that as well. Um, and also, we've been working very closely with the retailers who've been affected by this, um, providing testing services so that, um, to date, they can assure that they're not serving any water uh, to their customers above that EPA health advisory, and now, as you just heard, the state response level. Uh, and they've been successful at, at doing that. So just some of our results. So looking at GWS, our, our plan potable reuse project here, um, we've actually started looking at, the, at sort of the feed water we get from Orange County Sanitation District in the secondary effluent, that, that secondary treated wastewater. Uh, and we do find PFO and PFOS in that. Um, and as I'll get into, that's not entirely surprising. Uh, but then when we look at after all of our advanced treatment processes and our, our final product water from GB, GWS, we're consistently non-detect uh, for all PFAS compounds, including PFO and PFOS. And um, as many of you are aware, reverse osmosis is the heart of the GWS treatment process. And um, as, as, a, as has been established in the literature and through projects like ours, um, these PFAS comets are generally too large and too charged to, uh, to get through reverse osmosis. It's a very uh, well-established treatment barrier for that. Um, and so now we've, we're conducting regular monitoring, though, to, to continue to demonstrate this. And actually, through the, through the state, this is now a requirement of all reuse projects in the state need to test for PFOA and PFOS as a part of the regular monitoring. In terms of the metropolitan supply, um, we look at our OC28 connection. Uh, primarily call it a river water served to us. This is where we take this water in our spreading basins in Anaheim and percolate it for replenishment. Um, our results in that testing have been consistently non-detect for PFAS. And in our discussions with Metropolitan and the testing they've done throughout their system, they do not find uh, PFAS compounds throughout their system. And this monitoring is continuing here by the district. So now turning to the river. Uh, we've been speaking about the river this morning. Um, our kind of our key location where the water district monitors the water quality of the river before it, it enters any of our, our recharge facilities uh, is near Imperial Highway. Uh, 
And for many decades, we've been testing the water quality there on a monthly, quarterly, annual basis to verify the quality of what's coming to us from the upper watershed. Uh, and so we began testing for, for PFAS there about three years ago. Um, this is a little plot of the results we found. And kind of just the take home here is we, we do get consistent detections of PFO and PFS in that surface water in the Santa Ana River. Um, average about, about 37 nanograms per liter combined coming to us on a relatively consistent basis. Um, and so we decided to think about why are we finding this in, in the river? Why is this coming down to us? Um, and so some, one thing we looked at um, and done some research in the literature and kind of confirmed with that data we saw from Orange County Sanitation District is that the occurrence of these compounds in conventionally treated wastewater is pretty well established in the scientific literature over the last 10 to 15 years people have been looking. And we think this is due to just the widespread use of these consumer products showing up in clothing, waterproof clothing, uh, things like carpets. These are things that end up in, in sewer sheds and sewer systems. And conventional wastewater treatment processes um, are not really equipped to, to treat for them. Um, so this is something, sort of an emerging thing. People are learning that this conventionally treated wastewater is a potential source. And I think Darren mentioned that as well. Um, so as many of you are aware, there are wastewater treatment plants upstream of us on the Santa Ana River. So we reached out to three agencies uh, overseeing uh, five different uh, discharge facilities along the river uh, and worked with them and, and conducted some, um, some testing uh, with their permission of their, of their effluents, um, provided the data back to them, and have ended up sharing this both with the regional board and the Santa Ana River Dischargers Association uh, in a cooperative manner. So here's a map here of, of the upper watershed. Uh, the lower left is uh, kind of where the 71 and the 91 come together at, at Prado Dam, as we talked about earlier this morning, uh, and then going up into San in Riverside and San Bernardino. And so some of our results here we've been seeing, these, are, these results in white are just from the river, um, just the normal surface water. We do find PFO and PFOS in the river. And then yellow here are the results from those five facilities where we had did the cooperative testing. And not unsurprisingly, we do find it in the treated conventionally treated wastewater effluent. Um, so the take home here is kind of, this is probably one source. I think this explains um, primarily why we see this in the Santa River coming to us in Orange County, but we suspect it's probably not the only source of these to local surface water. Um, so kind of shifting gears now, back to um, kind of piggyback on what, what Darren was talking about. Um, in Orange County, the state phase investigation, the, the testing orders, um, we've received a number of these in Orange County retailers, uh, 66 in total. Um, out of the over 600 that were issued across the state. Uh, in our service area, in that OCWD service area, we had 12 retail agencies who received these testing orders covering a total of 53 wells. They're listed here. Uh, primarily related to UCMR3 detections as the criteria, but we also do have some landfills and also have some airports in the county that triggered uh, some of these monitoring orders as well. And so right now, um, our laboratories continue to perform this testing on behalf of our retailers. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we are the only public agency lab certified to perform this kind of testing in California. Um, it's a complex analysis. Uh, it takes about two or three weeks to turn around a sample um, due to sample preparation uh, and, uh, and the instrument. And that's, um, that's actually what, what our general manager says when we get the bill for one of these instruments. These instruments cost about $500,000 uh, for, for us to purchase, so very high-tech equipment. I need a skilled analyst to use them, and the quality insurance and data review are pretty, pretty intense to generate high quality data. Um, this, the, the sample collection procedures you need to follow, given the ubiquity of these contaminants in, you know, in daily life, in consumer products, clothing, food wrappers, um, very special procedures our staff has to follow, even in just collecting the samples to bring them to the lab before analysis. Um, so we're currently conducting this testing on behalf of those retailers that received the monitoring orders, uh, and the first quarter of those results are due to the state by July 10th. Uh, to give Darren and his colleagues some data to kind of help them wrap their arms around this question uh, statewide. So I thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Dr. Miller, take it away. Okay, the trailer. <laughs> Hopefully not the trailer bill, but anyways, uh, it didn't advance. On hold. The green one? We're on hold right now. Ah, okay. There we go. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. 
Uh, the lights are very bright, if you're wondering, and uh, someone had warned me about that, but I had no appreciation until now. <laughs> Basically, oh, that wasn't me, good. <laughs> Anyways, um, this is a talk of a little bit about the past, present, and future of these molecules. Um, this slide is borrowed from uh, Dr. Field, and if you're interested in the difference between per and poly, it's in the lower right-hand column. Basically, it talks about if they're all fluorinated, carbon to fluorine, then they're per, et cetera. But the reason I put this slide is to call your attention to her comment, unique chemistry. The carbon-fluorine bond is the shortest and strongest bond in nature. Very true, but these compounds do not occur in nature. They're actually man-made, and that's where they come from. And the second part of her comments there deal with their, uh, basically, they last forever, and uh, that's what Consumer Reports recently called them, the forever compounds. But just like us, there's nothing new. These compounds have been around for a long time. They started in the 1930s. I wasn't there, but anyways, <laughs> they did start there. I'm not going to ask if anyone was there out there, but uh, they've had a history, just like us, and a lot has happened from the Teflon pans through, we've heard the consumer products. Chemists have got very creative with, when it comes to these molecules, but perhaps the firefighting foams became uh, mostly widespread, and <clears throat> they served to present most of our problem. Uh, 2010. Uh, F, the PFOS Convention, POPs, that's the United Nations designation that these are global, they're found in polar bears, they're found in the Arctic ice, they're everywhere. So the real question is, we know it's in us, all of you here have this in your blood, it's not a question, that's a fact, and the question is, how did it get there? So people have already talked about consumer products. So this is a study that's being done by Sunderland in 2019. There's many studies like this, and they ask that question. Did it come from my popcorn bags, from my pizza, from my dental floss, or did it come from the drinking water? How much came from each of those sources? And that's a very important question. The one thing we do know that when they put controls in place, the levels in your blood go down. And for the PFOS, when they had regulations to discontinue this, starting around 2000, and P4, they have dropped 60 to 80% in the average blood levels of people. So we do know that if you control the sources, it will lower in your blood level. The problem is, as I said, the chemists get creative. And those of you who have done Ancestry or 23andMe and you have cousins, Hey, they have cousins. So if you look at Wang and All in 2018, the story of never-ending PFOS, P4 substances, there's more. They reported over 3,000. Um, I think people used to count sheep. I think these people must count these compounds. Uh, they used to be called PFC. They've fallen off the cousin tree uh, because they include uh, the gases, which are part of the greenhouse gases. So now they're called... Uh, basically, PFAS for waterborne. Treatment options. Ross looked at this in remediation in 2018. Um, let me just, like, I don't know if I can go back. Uh, obviously, the two most common treatment options are one, just close the well in. We've heard about that, and people have done that. The other one is to blend down to the level, but I'm not covering that, and he didn't cover that. So he came up with 14. Uh, Jason already mentioned that the RONF in the top there. So in what he plotted was the range of practicality, is it practical, versus the range of development, is it mature? And obviously the reverse osmosis, as Jason mentioned, is very effective, but for many people that would be too expensive. Very effective, very costly. So I'm going to talk about activated carbon and ion exchange. Activated carbon has been used many times. So we had gasoline and water, and we used activated carbon to take it out. We have problems uh, in our filters at home. We use activated carbon. We have refrigerator filters. We use activated carbon. And the key thing with PFOS, PFOS P4 is actually that the carbon you pick is critical. So you can't use the same carbon that they've been using, the fine grain one. You have to use a more coarse one. And as uh, Evoca says, at this time, 
EPA recognizes carbon as their best available technology. So that's one path. The other path is ion exchange. And this is like your water softener at home. So you all have water softeners and know about them. And in that particular case, the PFCs, this is an older slide, obviously, because they were still part of the cousin tree. And it goes across the resin beads, and they're trapped. And until we were under the microscope, I didn't realize that the people who left the resin actually thumbed their noses back at the people who got trapped. But now that we see that, I now clearly see what happens. But this uh, is the alternative process. These two processes are being installed in this country today. Which one's going to win? Which one do you vote for? Should I take a, no, I'm not gonna ask you. Anyways, but a lot of it has to do with the chemistry. And there's a hydrophobic tail, the carbon fluorine structure, and then there's the circled part, the ionized. Uh, the ionized part actually likes the ion exchange. And the other part is good for carbon. So it becomes a choice. But the thing that complicates life instead of looking at a single molecule, remember I had that cousin tree? There's 3,000 of these. So if you're out there as a water company and you are going to design a 20-year plan, are you going to design it for just two? You think the other? 3,000 are going to be ignored coming forward. So really, the only way to answer this question is to do you know, what the Orange County Water District is doing. They're taking Orange County waters, and they're going to run them in pilot units. And I think that you know, that'll get to the right answer for this area. If you go to a different area, they're going to have a different solution. But they will run pilots. There's things that happen in the pilot that you don't see except through the pilot. So it's not the chemistry is sort of known, but not the exact chemistry for this location. This is a plant that has been running for a year and a half in Northern California. It's the only one that I'm aware of that's running. It's using carbon because that was best for their situation. It was located next to a military base. Um, everything's been fine. We visited it and talked with them. Uh, for the engineers out there, the diameter is about 10 feet. So if you're just curious for scaling. In summary, no one here, the, they're everywhere. And they're in many forms. And they're in you. People are exposed through many, many pathways. And we know that when you control those pathways, that you control what's in you. We've seen that. That's what the blood shows. Thank you. Anyway. <laughs> So the main thing is that you actually can do some more controls yourself. I was talking to someone, and they said, oh, my dental floss has it. Well, maybe he might not want to use that form of dental floss. And treatment methods exist. So the, the question in the treatment methods, I think, which is going to be the interesting question, is how many of these 3,000 will be regulated? Because these plants will be there for a long time. And with that, I thank you. Turn this over to you. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to take a few minutes to kind of take all that in and ask the, our panelists a, a couple of quick questions, and maybe we'll have time to go to the audience here at the end. Uh, this is a confounding subject, as you've all heard. There's a lot that we know. Uh, there's a lot more that we don't know. And I think that one of the things that was really important that Dr. Milner mentioned is that this is going to be a community-centered sort of solution. So what works in one community may not work in another community. And that's, that solution is going to be driven by its unique characteristics um, of both environmental, the, the built environment, the natural environment, et cetera, not to mention this, what's been going on in society for, for decades. Uh, Jason, for you, I'm, I'm wondering, what are, can you maybe go over some of those specific qualities and characteristics about the Orange County Water District Service Area that make this such an important issue. You hit on the kind of the outcomes, but what are the what are the what are some of the things that make uh, the the combination of resources that the water district uses to manage water resources in this county um, susceptible to this, especially susceptible to this kind of uh, contaminant? Sure, sure. No, I think it's um, I think the, the you know the high percentage of, of usage of groundwater 
uh, is unique in Southern California. Um, which we take pride in being able to provide you know, 75% of the local water supply through groundwater. Um, but it appears that these contaminants are, do disproportionately appear to be affecting groundwater supplies around the country. Um, so I think that's something we're, we need to take stock in and understand, and I think we, we, we are doing that. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's a, big, a big part of it. Um, and the fact that we've relied on um, you know, surface water historically as a primary source of replenishment to the basin um, that in, in more recent times has been um, you know, affected by upstream wastewater discharges. Um, I think we're probably a little bit unique that way as well. Um, and that's something we, we, you know, we try to keep an eye on and we have extensive monitoring for that and continue to do that. Um, and so I think in, in that way, um, there's some unique characteristics I think that are, are presenting us with a challenge here in Orange County that are, that are different than you know, what a manufacturing town back east is facing or you know, a community located next to an Air Force base where they use some of these firefighting foams. So I do think there are unique aspects to the issue in here in Orange County that, uh, that we're attempting to address. Thank you. Uh, Darren, uh, we, we mentioned that some states have gotten ahead of the federal government and are setting advisory levels and response levels and MCLs uh, right now. As you can imagine, uh, this causes a lot of uh, confusion for customers and put, puts water agencies in a tough spot. Uh, can you tell me how the process that you're undertaking at the state is maybe a little different than some of the other states or the federal government and uh, how specifically you use this data that we're gathering today uh, to inform our policy uh, downstream? Yeah, so, um, you know, historically, most of the regulated contaminants that we regulate in California and throughout the nation come from US EPA establishing them in the Safe Drinking Water Act, and they did a big pile of them early on, and then there's kind of been a few, and then for several administrations now, there's been none. Um, it it uh, is, is a tough way to go. Uh, on the federal level, they have a component that uh, when they look at it, uh, they base it on a cost-benefit type of analysis, and that's different than California. So remember I said uh, our regulations say that we're to be as close to the public health goals we can. Our legislature wanted our water to be conceivably, you know, as pure and wholesome as we possibly can make it. You know, we never eliminate all the risk when we do regulations. There's always some that remains, uh, and we have those considerations of technical feasible and economic feasibility put in. Uh, when I get together with the other state administrators, they're kind of all over the board. You know, there are small states that don't have resources of toxicologists like we have here in California in the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment uh, that we can rely on to give us, to, to look at the studies and bring forth recommendations. So uh, some of them have had their legislator just grab numbers and impose them. Uh, others, uh, New Jersey does kind of follow a very similar path to ours and they're probably leading the nation. They have established MCLs, state MCLs for PFO and PFOS at the 13 and 14 numbers, um, both, and are working on some others. So it, it, it's unfortunate it is all over the map a little bit. I, I don't think in California it really changes kind of our realm though. So historically, we have seen the federal numbers and then we reevaluate that ourselves and decide whether we like that number or we want to go lower. And there are several MCL levels for different contaminants throughout the state that are at a lower level because our rules are different. And so, um, you know, it will, we'll kind of, we've always been a little bit different. And I think the rest of the states are now kind of joining the club and being different maybe than the federal government when they're absent in this. So in fairness, they have, US EPA has put out an action plan uh, to address PFO, PFOS. They're supposed to uh, come forward with some regulatory determinations by the end of this calendar year. And so we're looking forward to, you know, them getting back in the game on this. Thank you. So Dr. Miller, I'm thinking about um, the two treatment technologies you identified, and I want to get to a broader question of some of the actions that you're taking in, in your Belinda in just a minute, but I want to talk about activated carbon and, and, and how much work that you're seeing in your, uh, in your research related to uh, speciation of the carbon, uh, being specific about uh, manufacturing processes to activate it. Um, there seems to be um, a general sense that just use activated carbon, and we don't talk about where it comes from. You mentioned that the critical, it was a critical choice. What are some of the, are there, are there particular sorts of carbons that you have found that have worked well in, 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 those, uh, in this kind of application? Or is it a, more of a general, uh, a general activated carbon uh, application? <clears throat> well, first of all, my primary research is in air. So, <laughs> so, but uh, I've taught classes on using carbon. And the main thing that we've learned, because uh, we tend to be practical, the engineers, 
And so when you look at what's in practice, they've learned through pilot plants and through designs of commercial plants that the carbon that was used for gasoline, this microfine, you know, high surface area, small pores, uh, is less effective than as they had in the diagram there, one that's more coarse and coal-based uh, instead of basically coconut-based. Uh, so, um, but they learned that through experience. As I mentioned, these are things you try out and you, uh, it's one of the, it is the key parameter if you're going to use carbon, but you only learn after you try it out. And then thinking about more broadly, what's, uh, what you've been doing in terms of the investments that the Yorba Linda Water District has been making to interconnect its system and provide more flexibility and delivery. Can you tell, the, tell us a little bit about those efforts? Well, I, I would say, you know, from Yorba Linda, and this would be a general statement, number one goal for us is making sure the water meets the health standards. And so, for example, in, when Jason was running his program, uh, the unregulated contaminants, and he notified us that we had uh, PFOS, P4, in our water because that was what he was checking for. You know, at Yorba Linda, we saw that as an issue, and we started blending down to the advisory levels to make sure that, you know, we stayed below that for the water that we were delivering. But everyone, every water district here, you know, can't speak for all of them, in my opinion, that's their number one goal is meeting the health standards because in reality, if you don't, you're not delivering water. And I mean, you just have to keep a laser focus. But beyond that, we take a great pride in doing that. Delivering Thank you. Water. Yeah. And we, yeah, we find that across the, across the state and across the United States, frankly, as we work with uh, utilities on these issues. And I think now, um, if we have any audience questions, we have a couple of minutes left. And I'd like to take a question from the audience. It is right up here, but I do see one to my right here. He sees, I don't see. <laughs> Thank you, Doug Reinhardt with Irvine Ranch Water District. My, I have several concerns here. One is this is going to confuse our customers. So they're going to want to go to more bottled water. Who in the heck is even bothering to test whether bottled water has, you know, PFAS? And, and that's so that's one concern. The other is that who's looking at the, all these chemicals we're learning about, all these things in the water, the symbiotic effect between all of them, you know, not taken individually, but we're congregating them all in our water. Who's looking at that? And where are we going with that? Um, so, you know, there's so many things going out there that I, I wonder how that all affects us. I mean, even if it's in our bloodstream, obviously we're putting it back into the system through our own elimination system. So we're not really getting rid of it, we're just circulating it around. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> well, so being the regulator, um, <laughs> bottled water. Uh, bottled water is regulated by the Food and Drug Branch of the Department of uh, Public Health in California. It follows only the federal standards. None of the California standards for delivered water are included in the testing of bottled water. Take that as you like. Um, so you're correct. We would not know at this point whether there's PFO or PFAS or many other chemicals, um, nor do they have to meet the lower MCLs in California that our drinking water systems do. So uh, I'll definitely give a plug out to your tap water from your water systems in California as being supreme and uh, highly recommend that you drink from your uh, water and bottled water is, while certainly a regulated entity, uh, not regulated quite as much as your tap water. Thank you, and I think we, since we're running down to our last 15 seconds, oh, I'm sorry, we do have one more, we do have one more question. Please go ahead. Is it on? Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, I haven't heard anything about uh, quantified uh, health risk related to this. It's been around for 80 years, there's thousands of compounds, it's forever. How has that been quantified as negatively affecting our health? Yeah, so the, the health studies are, there, there are health studies and they're getting better all the time. Um, so when the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment does their assessment, they do two. They do a cancer-based and a uh, then first non-cancer health effect that they can see. And um, 
for people in PFAS, uh, they're in the process of giving me new numbers uh, that are going to be basically even lower than we expected for people in PFAS on a cancer basis. Now, California has a different, our cancer basis is, uh, that they use when they're doing the calculations is uh, one uh, cancer case per million people. So it's one in a million chance of an increased risk of cancer from 70 years of consumption of that material. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty stringent test uh, in that level. I, I, would, I guess I would say, rather than being emphatic about the health consequences of this, we know there are uh, potentials of increased cancer. We know there are other uh, impacts, and, and there's, they're kind of lengthy and uh, get into uh, you know, birth defects and other types of things. And there's, but I, I think I would end with, there's a lot more we have to learn on it. There's really a lot of studies that have to be done. It's kind of, the, the, the dilemma we face in a regulatory standpoint is, um, you know, we learn about the material, but then no one's tested it. And so we have this great fear of what it's causing. And so we establish limits, we kind of start to discern how far it is in the environment. And then the researchers go and say, oh, well, we need to test that and do the health tests on it. And those are in progress. And then they start to report back. And we go back and forth kind of in a, you know, stepwise fashion of learning from each other. We'll learn some health impacts, which of the PFASs may be more toxic, and then chase those down, and then, you know, we get into this, this process. Hopefully, though, with well, when I mentioned the read across approach, we can actually um, jump that a little bit. I, as a regulator, I get tired of chasing one chemical at a time, and at one point, one chemist told me that 15 minutes after I pass the regulation for PFO or PFAS or whatever PFAS I'm regulating, they'll design a new material that won't be regulated but will have the same outcome and product viability that their customers want. So um, it takes me about four to five years to get an MCL. If it takes them 15 minutes, I think I'm kind of beat uh, to the race on that. So um, we are trying to do these as a class. And that'll be uh, the first time we've ever done that, where we can try to say, look, all of these materials that have these properties maybe should fall into this, and then they'll be regulated together, and we can uh, take a new approach. But that's all brand new, and we hope the science comes out. Uh, OEHA is working hard to try to do that with a lot of other scientists to get there. Well, this certainly is a confounding issue. There's a lot of work left to be done. I want to thank each of our panelists. And please join me in, well, in saying thank you to Darren, Jason, and Dwayne.